Hello, and welcome to the California Wealth Warrior Podcast with the man himself, Ray Almo. Ray is single-handedly dedicated to the notion that if you don't want to leave California, you don't financially have to flee the Golden State. Ray, good to be with you. How are you, my friend? I am wonderful, Bill. Thank you so much. Um, spring is uh, abundant here in California. All the flowers are blooming. My allergies are going nuts. And that I enjoy for California. So yeah. <laughs> at any rate, um, hey, before we get to our platform here and one of my um, good friends, Javier Bandestig, uh, remember we were talking about why I do this and- yep you know, my legacy. And, um, we talked about, uh, my grandfather, Harold Olmo. And mm -hmm. since then i have been digging up a lot of family stuff. And I stumbled into an article called Mr. Grape back in the eighties, you know, good name, but look at this bill, uh, new grape varieties developed by professor Olmo had their most significant impact in California where 80 for 84% of the nation's wine is produced. Wow. In 1972, for example, the most widely planted vine in the state was his Ruby Cabernet. It is similar to the taste of Cabernet Sauvignon, but it's twice as productive and can be grown in hotter climates. I mean, talk about fuel in the wine industry. And again, this astounds me. I didn't even know that much. I just knew he was, you know, revered. So at any rate, um, again, these are some cool things that uh, wish we could uh, be in that era, but um, now we're in our current era of craziness. Well, so let's let's fight on. You know, but wait, we're in the era where we can appreciate, literally appreciate, the fruits of your grandfather's enterprise in, in a most delicious way. So yeah, it's worth pausing for a second and acknowledging that. That's great. That's great, right? <laughs> All right. So today, what we're going to do is we're going to meet a, a very good friend of mine, somebody I respect highly. I've known um, him a long time and um, everybody loves Javier. And he, is, he he's always more interested in your business and how he can help your business than anything else. And so he, he, he has a, a quite the following and he's built a phenomenal company. <laughs> So without further ado, let me quickly introduce you to Javier Vandestig, CEO of Asset Preservation Inc., which is a 1031 qualified intermediary. Javi, welcome. Hey, thank you. It's great to be here. Appreciate the opportunity. Looking forward to it. Yeah. And we've already seen each other this year for our, our, uh, our regular lunches. And I think I'm privileged to be one of the rare get that gets you at a lunch. <laughs> so I appreciate that. At any rate, um, always good stuff with us. We've had a, a lot of fun over the years. And gosh, I'm trying to think back. We're 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 over 20 years, right? The Great Bay easily, Ventures. Yeah. yeah. So again, great, great times and and watching uh our Northern California grow. Um, that said, uh Javier and his company are nationwide. Um, I, I'm gonna let him speak as to you know what the contribution is with California. But what we're gonna do today is we're gonna talk about the, in, the, in some of the first episodes, I promised everybody that we're going to methodically build on things. And so I started with these, these generalities, okay, of the two main things, issues in California that, that, that are a must for planning, <clears throat> asset protection, lawsuits, and tax planning, right? Duh. So then as we built into that, uh, we're talking about the, some of the complexity of things that are required, trust, which is what I do. And then we pull in certain people and professionals. And now where we're at is we're actually dig it, digging into within the schematic, if, if everybody, all of my listeners remember, is we we're looking at trust entities, and now we're at assets. And the first asset we're going to start with is real estate. And I had Jim Cunningham on last episode. We talked about specifically California and some of the California reg regulations, because it's the only one that has a Prop 13 reassessment and Prop 19 um, issues that you need to be very concerned about when you're managing your real estate. But we're going to raise the bar now on how to build wealth safely. And so we're going to do a deep dive with probably, I, I would say, knows more than every tax attorney in, in, the, in the U.S. But uh, Javier, um, you know, again, I'm going to let you kind of run with this. I do have some topics I wrote down, and I want to make sure that we we hit and that, and that um, 
you know, we're, we're targeting a couple things that I just don't think people know. Okay. And so, uh, but first, is there any, uh, you know, knowing what the California Wealth Warriors mission statement is, is there anything that you would like to set the stage with? Um, you know, I, having watched some of your, your podcasts before and kind of knowing your overall strategy, um, your, your strategies are long, you know, seem to be very long-term and very, very planning oriented where, you know, I, I get into the picture on very specific pinpoint transactions that have large capital gain consequences, both state and fed. So, you know, I work on a very specific transactional level, you know, obviously what I do for people and what our company here at asset preservation does is, you know, handle a specific problem, which is really a solution toward the end all goal of, of really valuable estate planning. Yeah, true. In, in, in terms of ensuring that the transaction going from asset one to asset two is, is honored and perfected. Okay. Without risk. But when you look at 1031 in general, most people that drank the Kool-Aid is I'm just going to go ahead and keep deferring all my gains and go build this, this wealth over my lifetime. Right. And so it does become a longevity. And that is some of the things we're going to talk about is, you know, when do you get out? How do you get out? What's the damage? How do you manage that and all that stuff? But yeah, your job is certainly to make sure that the, um, that there's not issues in the transactions and this listeners, this goes back to, I just had um, a couple calls in recently. One was a $4 million case. And, uh, and Javier, I remember you said, this is like, he's like, ah, I just, I, I just sold the building and I'm going to do this. And it's like, and these are smart people. And I, and it just, you got to get ahead of these things. If you even think that you're going to tr uh, transact and go from, you know, asset to asset, meaning real estate to real estate, right? Like kind or not. Okay. Every, every option warrants, what is the plan to do so effectively? So um, what we're going to assume though, is we're going to go to asset to asset and real estate to real estate. And then later we'll talk about when that monster accrues and the, the roosters come, how, how do we get out? So um, why don't you recap? I know we're going to talk about some advanced stuff, but uh, you and I talked before the show. Why don't you go ahead and recap the baselines of 1031s and what the variants are? Sure. So probably everybody knows, you know, the basics and, and part of our job in the very beginning of, of a transaction, and we do, you know, tens of thousands of these on a kind of an annual basis. So we, we, we see, you know, everything from the cookie cutter, real basic stuff to extremely complex, very, very large transactions. But, you know, in a nutshell, as, as everybody probably knows, you have to, when you have a contract on a investment property, for, that's for sale, you need to, if you want to potentially do an exchange or, or definitely do an exchange to defer that capital gain tax, you've got to get your exchange set up with your qualified intermediary, um, you know, well before the close of the transaction. So, you know, typically we contract with or we get our clients uh, all the information on, we, we do an analysis of the, of the transaction. We look at the ownership. Um, there's a, there's kind of a, unwritten rule in 1031, it's called the same taxpayer rule. And that can be actually very complicated uh, in different states that are community property or non-community property, but we'll do an analysis and make sure that, that the basic rules set the exchange up prior to close. The day that it closes is gonna begin the 45 day identification period, which is, you know, in the past has been one of the more problematic parts of compliance. And then obviously when that clock starts at the close of escrow, the 180 day clock starts as well, which is less problematic than the 45 day identification. So, you know, that's your basic sell property A, do everything correctly, buy property B, identify that property in 45 days. We're there to set up all the legal documents along the way, hold the money and fund the acquisition of property B when it's ready to close. That's so your that's, basic fundamental exchange. Yeah. And, and that's the intermediary, intermediary part. Okay. So um, you're, they're holding escrow and they're holding the funds 
um, as you're changing title from asset A to B, right? Right. Um, <laughs> okay, so we covered. And, go and ahead. I get, let me add to that. You know that that's kind of the basic setup. You know of of the deal. We'll, we we got to get a copy of the contract and the title report and confirm how title is held and and discuss any problems with the, the the exchanger as as this is getting set up. But the other rule, kind of kind of to capsulize the basics, is to defer all of your capital gain. And again, ten thirty one is a federal tax code, um, but all states recognize it. So any any state tax obligation would also be deferred under a proper 1031. Oh, good point. So yep. the basic rule though is is regarding the dollars and cents. <laughs> if you acquire the replacement property of equal or greater value and spend all of the net cash, right? Net cash would exclude the payment of expenses commissions, closing costs, and exclude the debt payoff on the property that was sold. So if you sold for $3 million and you had a loan and you had expenses and you had a net of two, the, in that exchange, if you bought for three or more and you spent all the two as the down payment on the, the new property, you'd be 100% tax deferred. Right. Okay, great. What? In some of those transactions, what are some of the curveballs that you see that can disrupt a, a seamless transaction, make it non-seamless? Uh, probably the most common one is where a, a multi-member LLC or a partnership owns the property that's being sold. Right. And the partners are not, or they don't desire to go together as a partnership multi-member LLC and buy the replacement properties when they want to split ways or, uh, is when you have problems. Right. In Cal California, I know we're, we're, we're really focusing on California issues. California is, it, they're much more stringent on this. They attack this problem more than the feds or any other state for that matter. Yeah, th well, this, this goes in line with the Prop 13 reassessment that no other state has, which is if you don't have um, same percentage or, or or you change more than 50%, uh, you know, and you don't do the escrow and title right, you could trigger that. And that is a big problem. We actually, even in the trust world, we don't mess with that. We have a whole legal team that deals with that and make sure that when you're dealing with trusts and LLCs and assets that they're following through and then integrating with guys like you and on facilitating the proper transaction for the tax deferral. So there, there is a team that needs to work together to make sure that you safely get through these landmines. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. So, um, Thanks for the overview. Appreciate that. The, the other thing I think we want to talk about, I know you've done a, a bunch of crazy 1031s. You know, I, I, I know you do did some like jumbo jet exchange for a fortune company or something crazy, but for, for our average listener, you know, and, uh, and that I kind of broke it up into classes. Okay. You know, you, you kind of got, uh, I hate to say the small guy, but you, you have somebody that that's just into a few, uh, transactions and then you get some that, are, that have accumulated a lot. And then you get some that are developers, investors. Let's talk about those different classes, right. In, institutional, et cetera. Sure. I mean, you, you, there's more than three classes, but if I were to put them into three classes, I, I would say, you know, a, a big bulk of our business is the individual investor. And that's, that's you know, an individual, maybe maybe they own their properties in an LLC, that, but that's really not the point. The point is it's an individual or a couple um, or even a family that has investment property. So they do exchanges, you know, night and all day long. They're, they're, they're just, they permeate the space. Um, and, and the other would be, you know, institutional investments or investors, uh, large, uh, kind of in your your REIT category or your your <coughs> private investment companies, um, and they they they're very active. Those are your larger um, large commercial deals. Um, you know, often in the several hundred million dollars or more. Uh, our our largest transaction in our thirty three year history was 
1.2 billion uh, on a, on an asset sale. Um, and then there's corporate. Well, you, you're you're going to do Mario Lago, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. For yeah. uh, 18 million. <laughs> yeah, 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 15 now, I think. Yeah. But uh, you know, so you have you have those those very large clients that do just repeat business, um, and that's that's your team of lawyers on on every conference call. They have very good you know attorneys. They have very good tax counsel. And those deals honestly are easier than the twelve million dollar deal owned by you know a couple because they don't ha typically have that team that can can guide them and they they often you know look look to to me in often cases where you know they really should have their tax team with them um, and that doesn't always happen. Now uh, on that point, so if if you were to prefer somebody before they go knocking at the door. And I know what people do, you know, the same thing with our firm is they they contact us and their assumption is you're going to handle everything head to toe. And and we are missing that that team member. We same thing with the CPAs. We've got to have them involved to made it to facilitate, right? So if you were to have um, you know, kind of um the preface uh, before they come asking you, would it be the CPA? Would it be a tax attorney? Uh usually they're CPA, but in many cases there's there's work that needs to be done that is really more in line for uh, an attorney because a lot of a lot of people want to set up special purpose entities to acquire the property you know those kinds of things where the CPA couldn't can do it but right. yeah you might want an attorney yeah okay good um so it, it, uh we talked about the different, I, I kind of broke it down into institutional, um, then individual investors. And I've got some clients that I've got a doctor that is, is a, more of a businessman. He's got 45, you know, uh, uh, residential properties inside an LLC that we have in a trust uh, that we account for. And he's just a junkie, you know, so that's, that is what he does now trying to get out of the physician space. <laughs> so, yeah. and then, and then of course, you know, we have the more mature market was kind of, I call that coupon clipping. They just want their stream of income. They want to get a certain ROI. And we're, we're going to talk about what that ROI might look like these days in this economy. Matter of fact, let's do that. Let, I made a note here. I'd like your perspective. Okay. <laughs> Um, and what the economy looks like now, and maybe let's even compare and contrast it to like the 08 market crash. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I would say compared to 08, the market we're in, it, it's not as dramatic. Uh, and that's a problem. You know, if you read, if you read all the stuff out there, which most of us probably do, um, you know, you hear the horror stories of office. Um, well, true. I mean, offices segment is in a bad place. Um, but a lot of the people writing those articles for the Wall Street Journal or or some of the others are sitting in Manhattan, where that segment is significantly worse than a lot of other places. Right. Um, and then, you know, if you just generalize and say commercial real estate in general, well, you know, there. if you look at mobile home parks, if you looked at mini storage, if you looked at even surprisingly, retail is in has been performing very well. So I think you just have to be careful when you read those generalized articles about the the condition of the market. Um, it certainly is on a local basis if you really were to analyze any of that. But in comparison, I I I mean, we all know these numbers don't lie because they're national numbers. The, the volume of commercial real estate transactions are are significantly lower by in the 35 percent range okay. right about now. So that I mean, that's a big dip. Um, residential investment property is also is also down. But that is, you know, like commercial, it's it's rate driven in a lot of cases. Right. It, it, it doesn't really make sense in many cases if you just run basic cash on cash returns if i sell an investment residential property and i've got a loan at 3.5 percent if i were to try to improve my position by going somewhere else where you know the market may be better for years to come i'm going to be faced with a seven percent 
mortgage. Right. So that just eats into your ROI to the point where it, it almost doesn't make sense to move it right now. Right, right, right. Um, as an alternative, if somebody has been in long term and let's say they invested after the market crash and they started build, building their corpus and, the, and they've they've got a, a lot of real estate and, and instead of going out and continually leveraging debt, maybe they've built up enough equity that they just go and exchange using equity and no debt. And do you see a lot of that or no? Well, I, I wish that that was the answer. Uh, and the reason why it's not is because uh, if you remember back, that what we call the equation for full tax deferral says that if I sold for three million and I paid off my previous loan and I ended up with two, I have to replace that new property. That The new property has to be of three million or more, which means I have to get a, a new loan equal to what I had before or more. Hmm. Okay. Now it is, it's very possible, not, not a well-known fact, but I could go buy the new investment property, whether it's one or multiple properties and have no debt, but I would have to add cash to get to 3 million because I only have two. Right. Which, which a lot of people actually do, because if you're taking out a, you know, $800,000 <laughs> mortgage at 7%, you know, your cash on cash is boosted significantly. Right. Okay. So again, what we're trying to do is explore all these uh, deviations of uh, trying to continue to manage going forward as an alternative to what's traditionally being known by people in this straight path. Because now, again, what we have is a bunch of landmines thrown in front of us for all different, you know, reasons. What do you think about the uh, the election and, and impact over the next year? Um. I don't, I mean, it's not, I, I don't think he, regardless of who gets elected, I don't think it moves the needle in, in any way for what we do here as an intermediary for 1031s. Okay. Uh, there is, Biden has put out a, uh, a proposal to limit or cap the, the 1031 deferral to at 500 grand. But, yeah. I, I call, I called you the second I read that I called you. Yeah. It, 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 I go, Hey, what do you think? And you're like, no. <laughs> yeah. It's thrown in there with everything else in the kitchen. Think, you know, who knows? I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. And, and like, I mean, they, they're, they're attacking everything. We're going to change the, the, the tax uh, deferred or tax-free growth of life insurance policies. that has been around for a hundred years. And, and yeah, it's, it was just a blanket. We're going to tax yeah. the world. <laughs> so how about taxing unrealized gains? Yeah. Yeah. That one's on there too. Yeah. Well, that's an easy one to account for. I'll give them that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Not even close. So we'll see how that flushes in. And, and, okay. So now piggybacking on what you, you know, you see um, let's, let's shift from interest rates, which we know are definitely higher as an impact. Okay. For, from inflation and the fed. Uh, let's talk about cap rates. What is, how has that impacted cap rates? I was talking to our friend that you introduced me to, Eli, the other day, and 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 trying to you know get a gauge on their mobile home park industry, get a gauge on what the cap rate impact looks like. What do you what are you thinking there? Cap cap rates are definitely going up. Okay, right because the cost of money is much higher. Okay, um, cap rates are going up also because the volume of activity is way down. There's less what? demand. Pardon, Javi. Why don't you explain what cap rates are for our audience? <laughs> cap rates are, cap so. rates are a factor of return uh, based on price. So as a cap rate goes down, that means prices go up. So when you hear that hear cap rates are going up, that means the prices are going down. It's all a factor of of NOI, net operating income, and it, you know if you want to think simply, it, you could think of it as what's the return on my investment. What's the return on my cash? So cap rates in in very safe, call it say like triple net properties. You want to go buy a 7-Eleven or you want to go buy an, uh, you know, an auto zone or a McDonald's or something like that. Those those are very safe coupon clipping type investments. And those returns are are in the four and a half to five and a half generally in that range. You know, the the riskier the investment, i.e. the the guarantee that you're going to get your lease payments, the, the riskier that gets the cap, the, the, the cap rates get higher. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you pay less, but you know, there's a little more risk that 
there's that company could go out of business. Yeah. So, so audience, again, there's uh, different industries use different uh, metrics uh, in calculations formula, if you will, um, business R ROI, ROE, return on equity, um, IRR for the investment world, and then cap rates is kind of, because it takes into consideration all the variables that you want to evaluate, right? Would that fair? Yeah, fair. Okay, good, good. All right, we're moving through and, and checking the boxes here. Um, uh, well, of course, yeah, you know, I, I know that majority, almost everything you do is is federal, but I do want to, you know, tackle anything related in California. Again, uh, the props in California are unique to only California. Um, we had Cunningham discuss that. Why don't you discuss anything that affects the 1031 on, on California regulation or legis legislation, excuse me? Yeah, sure. Um, so probably the, the, the biggest one that I always, you know, we as a company um, always make sure people understand um, because we get a lot of people that call and say, you know, I moved to Nashville. Okay, great. Well, I'm, I'm selling my investment property in California. I got to get out of California. I said, well, that that's great. However, so just think that through. So if you were to sell your investment property and in, in 1031 into Nevada, as an example of a no income tax state. Right. Well, that's great. And now you live in Nashville. Okay. So you, you don't, you don't have tax on the income from that investment property because you exchange out of California. But when you did the exchange, the, the, the let's say that your state tax capital, your state capital gains tax in California was 500 grand, just as an example. You defer that tax by 1031 in, into Nevada. However, California has this wonderful law called the clawback provision. So California law says that even though you don't live in California anymore and you exchanged out of California, so you're no longer even filing a California tax return, you have no, no, no direct nexus to California, the clawback provision says when you 1031 out, you have to continue every year to file a form, an informational form that says, I did not sell the Nevada property that I exchanged into when I left California and did not pay them the $500,000 tax that I owed them. So when you when you, when the year comes, if it comes, where you actually liquidate the property you exchanged into, you have to then pay California's deferred tax from years before. Now, if the Nevada property went up considerably, you wouldn't pay tax to California on that gain, only the gain that you deferred when you exited. I, I was just going to, I was just going to ask you, is it okay? Is it locked in there at the base at that basis or does, is it accrue on the gain of the new property? So thank you no. for an, answering yeah. that. <laughs> and cause you know, I don't, I don't know the mentality of these guys on all these, uh, you know, what they're trying to, to grab onto. Uh, you mentioned that was form 3840. Correct. Okay. Got it. And that uh, is that tie into CalFERPA or is that separate? That's separate. Okay. We're going to talk about that too. Okay. So thank you for that one. So that clawback again, everybody needs to know, I think this is again, going to lead to, you know, are you, are you staying in California? Are you leaving California, et cetera? Um, talk about CalFERPA, Javi. So CalFERPA uh, generally says that if you are selling a property in California that is not your primary residence, at the closing, the the title company or the escrow company will have to withhold three and a third percent of the sales price and send it to the franchise tax board. So okay. what they're trying to do is make sure that they capture something and keep it until that person files their California tax return, at which point, whether that three and a third was too much, then, then you get some back. And if it's not enough, you're going to have to pay more to cover what the actual capital gain tax for California would be. Got it. If you do a 1031, you get an exempt, a, a temporary exemption 
from that three and a third withholding. Okay. So 1031 is a full tax, full deferral if you do everything right. So that withholding can is exempt unless you don't complete the exchange, at which point we they they tax us with the burden of having to because we have the money. They they let's say they don't buy anything. So they no withholding at the close of escrow. Now the money comes to us as, as the intermediary. If they don't buy replacement property, then we have to take three and a third from the money and send it to FTB. Got it. Okay. Okay. Good, good. Are those the only two things that are affiliated with California? Uh, besides the fact that they're that impactful. A lot, a lot more... Um, stringent they're a lot more aggressive on attacking um 1031 type issues or gray areas okay you just have to be more careful in california yeah yeah that comes that comes with uh, the whole shoot and match of everything that we're talking about these days um okay well in, in california i would say is, is probably unique uh, other than new york and just the amount uh, the value of properties and then the amount of accumulated value of properties is probably substantially larger than any other state. Is that probably a good assessment? Yeah. So you're playing, so you're playing with some large numbers, which means you're playing with large numbers. You need to, this is going to lead to the next phase, which is you need to find properties at that level. So what is the, what does the inventory in the marketplace look like for somebody who says, you know, like my, my, my buddy that uh, called me and says, Hey, I'm getting out of Oakland because I got four, you know, it's, I bought it for 800. It's, it's worth 4 million, but now there's a bunch of people parked in front and I just don't want to deal with it. And I'm going to go and I want to look at an exchange. Can't find anything. So what are your thoughts on inventory? Well, like I, you know, I tell people, I said, you're, you, you sold in California, wherever in California, you're not limited to buying in California. Correct. Right. So, you know, in that, in that $4 million case, an individual like that might say, well, I, I, I've got all kinds of things I could do. I, I could buy property in another state that I think will appreciate more or, or you know, or better in the years to come, um, less crime, less whatever. Um, and, and they may buy a property or two in different States. They may also, um, might want to buy a property that they ultimately in the next few years might want to start using personally. Right. So we'll do a lot of exchanges where they buy in, uh, you know, I don't incline village, you know, something, an example close to home, they might buy in, you know, Florida, they might buy in Texas and, and with the, with the understanding that they, they are going to want to use it as a, a, not a, maybe not a primary residence, but as a second home. Okay. I think what you need to understand there is that that adds the, the concept of property management to the, to the fray. And what does it look like in terms of that cost contributed, you know, or added in, right? Yeah. Yep. And, you know, people can also short-term rental um, residential property as well. And that, that, that satisfies the investment requirement. Oh, good. That's okay. That's a good point. Love it. All right. Um, so let's say again, you know, somebody's accumulated nicely, rates are putting pressure on inventory. They don't like the options of maybe out of state, like you just shared. And so, so all the confines are just closing in and, you know, people, they want, they want their cake and eat it too. And so they ask, I want to do this. And then you put a wall in front of them and they, they get agitated. It, it just seems like you put a lot of walls in front of them. So what, let's talk about some exit strategies. And I don't know, I, I don't know that I like the, the word exit strategy. I like the word uh, option. So, you know, I know there's reverse exchanges. So let's talk about what a reverse exchanges um, do you know, why they're available, how they work that might be different than regular 1031s? Yeah, th th that's a good point. There, I'm going to go over quickly two variations that everybody should be aware of because they're, they're, they're opportunistic, uh, they're creative, they solve problems, and at the end of the day, they can provide a lot of value compared to the normal standard sell A, buy B. So Thanks. the 
Yep. So the first one's a reverse <laughs> change. So I'll, I'll give you a good example for all of our institutional, big, huge, long standing, long time clients, in particular the REITs. So REITs, and we're talking big, big numbers here, they only do what's called a reverse exchange, meaning a reverse exchange is kind of literally what it stands for, reverse. So it means that you have to or want to, in a REIT's case, you want to close the replacement property first. So when I say this, a complicated structure can become very simple. It is impossible to have a valid exchange if the taxpayer, the REIT or the individual doing the exchange, if they ever bo own both the replacement property and the property they're selling, the relinquished property, they can never own them both at the same time. Right. So if a REIT is going to sell a $300 million asset, the last thing that that REIT can do is not have a, a perfect 100% guaranteed exchange. Because if they have that, if they have a failed exchange, every bit of that game by law must be passed on to all the shareholders of the REIT. Yeah, it's, it triggers the tax. Right, and they'll never do that. So how do you avoid that? How do you guarantee a 100% perfect exchange? Well, you do a reverse because what that means is you're gonna buy the new $400 million asset first. Well, I just said you can't own them both at the same time. So how do you solve that problem? And that is easily done by having us step in and form an entity. And long story short, we close on the $400 million asset in our entity's name. And this is all governed by IRS uh, rules and regulations. So it's it's we're not making all this up. So we <laughs> we close we close on this new asset. And from the day we close it, they've got 180 days, kind of like a reverse of the normal exchange, to close on the asset they're selling. The day that that closes, we transfer the new asset to them and their exchange is over in literally a few days. Got it. Yep. Now, you were just talking about big numbers. So let's go down to a, a smaller number. The other option for... Um, the guy at my, my level is, you know, I'm sitting on something, um, you know, I'm getting what I need, but it's not growing as much. I wish it, I could improve it. And then all of a sudden I stumble into, uh, you know, a high cash flow value property and I get a deal I can't refuse. Right. So I can go identify and look at buying that new property. Right. Even though I wasn't planning on selling my own, own one, get the new one and then go and ask her to sell the, the old one. Yeah, so you can go buy a new property. You can't close it in your name, but you we can close it in our name. That's what I'm saying. You, you, you're yeah. holding it, but I don't want to. I don't want to miss out on that property. So, and there's time that it takes for me to sell over here, and you know, and maybe there's other bidders or offerings going on over there. So I can go if I have the the cash, and I can go offer. Have you guys buy that property knowing full well, I'm going to go sell my other property because yep. it's not quite as productive cash flow wise as the new one. Right. right. So I'm, up, I'm upgrading pretty well. Exactly. So your, your, your 1031 is always are, are, are the, the given the denominator is that they're making a move. You, you make a move from A to B for, for a reason. Right. So yep. if you want to, if you want to go from A to B, you want to do it in the normal fashion, which is sell A and then buy B. But what happens if B <coughs> presents itself and it's close it or lose it? Well, you don't want to lose it because it, you know, it's perceived to be the deal. It's what you want. Then you have to do a reverse because A, your existing property is not sold yet. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So the other the the other variation where we also take title, and this is a really good good exchange. I love these. So let's say I sell a property, that $4 million property in um, in Oakland or San Leandro or whatever, wherever your buddy is. And um, and he goes out and he finds a 12-unit apartment complex in Boise. Well, cash flow is going to be way better. 
He's, you know, he's got a professional management, which takes his personal management off the table. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, that's a, that's a much better return than what he's got in Oakland. However, that 12 unit apartment building is only 3 million. Okay. Well, options would be buy it at 3 million and pay tax on a million. Right. Because he sold for four. He didn't like that. That's going to cost him $360,000 in tax. He could buy a, a second property for a million or more to cover his four million exchange. So, so you can split and pool together to to aggregate, right? Right. You could buy multiple properties to get to your target number of four million. Okay. But what if what if this this deal in Boise is 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 such a good deal because it's rents are under under market, but the units haven't been upgraded in 25 years. And if they were upgraded, the return on investment would be significantly enhanced. So how that would work. So this is the opportunistic type exchange that I, I love. So what we would do is he would be in contract to sell Oakland for 4 million. He'd go make an offer to buy Boise at 3 million. What we would do there is we would do the same thing like a reverse, but we, we would take title to the 12 unit apartment complex in Boise. Mm -hmm. It's not in his ownership, it's in ours. And then throughout his 180 day exchange window, he would do a complete refurbishment of the units, the parking lot, the laundry, blah, 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 blah and spend a million dollars doing that. At which point we then transfer the property to him and now he's at four million sale, four million purchase, but he got a real value add deal right. by buying it needing rehab. Got it. So if the if the acc accumulation of the assets at the, at the current equity level aren't aggregating to that, then you could invest in and put in cash as, as the alternative to upgrade and get it to that level. Correct. There you go. Okay. I'm I'm starting to get it, Hobby. I'm starting to get after 20 you know, years. In another 20 years, um, you'll have yeah. it. Uh, I'm yeah. sure. Uh, yeah. Um so yeah, this is all great stuff. Um now again, well, I got an uh, so another one. So there used to be these things called ticks, tenants in common. And I it was a while ago. It was has it been 10 years when they changed that over? To, uh, more like 14, I think. Wow. Okay. So, so even pre-market crash. Yeah. So I, I remember that in the day, which is we can exchange into tenants in common fragmented properties. And now that, that changed to Delaware statutory trust. I got that right this time. Okay. So um, why don't you, uh, um, you know, okay. elaborate right. on so that. It, everything we've talked about so far has been great. Really good overview of California stuff and the basic variations of the exchange. But, but what's the what's the end of the day play? Right. Where, what's the long game look like? Because most people, you know, I'm outside of the re, you know, institutional stuff. We're talking about everybody below that. I mean, there's a point in time where you 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 get real tired of managing property. You know, um, the long game play for a lot of people is a triple net deal, where they have enough equity to go out and buy that 7-Eleven with a 20 year lease plus 10 year extensions, you know, at a five cap, it, it, they're going to get a monthly check. They have to do nothing. Right. Okay. That's coupon option. clipping. Yeah. Yeah. Coupon clipping. But there's another way to do it when you don't have three, four, five million dollars. And that is uh, a <coughs> DST or uh, what's known as a Delaware statutory trust. So this is just another form of, of multiple investors buying into a very large asset, um, very large, meaning typically a $50 million and up type of property. So the government back in 2008 validated this structure to, as, as, as to it, it qualifying for a 1031. So a classic example might be, I sold you know for $1.5 million, some investment property, and I net after my loan payoff and my expenses, I net a million dollars. Well, a million dollars is not going to buy you a 7-Eleven. 
It's not going to buy you much in terms of a nice triple net deal you can coupon clip. So, but a million dollars could very well, very easily put you into a nice DST. So a DST is a, a product, a property, an asset that's, that is put, to, put out to market by typically a REIT. So a REIT will buy a $80 million FedEx distribution center outside of Atlanta. But these are not securitized, right? They're not securities. They're not securities. Okay, we got to be careful for the listeners that this is not pulled in and sold to the you know the 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 Schwab market, right? This is, no. this is through the real estate sector, right? So <laughs> you, you, it, it's not a security, although it's regulated like a security. You're making an investment into a particular asset, right? So my example was uh, an eighty million dollar. FedEx distribution center outside of Atlanta. So the REIT buys that property and then puts it out to market for anyone with a hundred thousand or more to invest as a co-owner. So that particular property is a five and a half percent cash on cash return. So I invest in that property and every every month or every quarter, depending on the read itself and how they do it, I'll receive my check. Got it. So it's is a very there... passive, passive way to exchange out of something that was management intensive into a coupon clipper that I could never afford to buy on my own. Got it. Right. And um, for in the management that the reads do with that, it, it uh, you don't have to sit there and let's say it was a $10 million total and you're putting in a million, you don't have to wait for all the investors to, to invest the other nine, right? It's in, it's in units, right? It's in, yeah. You, you, you own a million dollar share of the trust, the so, Delaware statutory trust. So there's an investment side where you're buying the units and, and on what's the current inventory and then they're buying and selling the, in the inventory. No, 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 oh. no, that's not right. Okay. So that, what you're describing is is what a real REIT would look like. Okay. So in a REIT, I buy shares of X, X REIT. That REIT has a huge portfolio of property, and I get a return based on their portfolio. In this case, the REIT says, I, I want 1031 money. The only way they're going to can get 1031 money is to buy an asset and put it in, and, and oh, the ownership is in a DST structure. Got it. So I'm literally, when I'm, DST investors are looking at five different offerings that are on the market, and you're looking at a particular property and and the attributes of that property. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I got that flipped around. Yep. Again, so, you know, uh, I don't very think- Very common. I, I don't think I'm stupid, but- I, you know, this is above my pay grade. Why I call you, buddy? <laughs> so, um, well, I, look, I listened to your uh, last week's podcast or your last one, and I I, I didn't understand anything. <laughs> okay, it's probably because we were talking about women. Oh, that's true. Yeah, yeah. No, all right. So uh, we're going to wrap up here, Bill. I know um, we've got uh, just under ten minutes. Uh, the last thing we want to do is is ultimately, you know, it's just, it's going to be exit. And this does affect, you know, California because it does trigger the tax. So all said and done, again, we want everybody to know all their options, okay, at all levels. And we want them to to diversify their planning, okay? And, and again, I see these things from the trust level because I see real estate and that's the majority of our assets is, is real estate. You know, I've got a client that has 40 LLCs with 40 commercial buildings downtown LA and okay. So, but they're in trust and we're reporting on the values of the, of the LLCs and the assets and the trust, and they know this stuff. So they're doing all this stuff. But again, for our, you know, average California, small, small business owner guy, entrepreneur guy, um, you know, to try to master this stuff, I wanted to bring you to the table because you are certainly the master in my opinion um, and give them the resource. Um, you, you and I spoke about this numerous times. Once it comes out of the 1031 sector, okay, and it triggers, um, we know of uh, alternatives or op offsets, if you will, okay, because now the tax is coming, it's going to fall out of 1031, right? And let's say that was today, 
uh, then April 15th next year, the tax that was triggered today is going to be due, right? Okay. Yeah. So the question is, I still have the cat. I still have the tax in hand, knowing I got to pay that in April 15th next year. What do I do to maybe mitigate that tax? And that's called tax offset planning. And again, you're, you, I've known you so long that you, you stay in your lane, buddy. And I know you have some resources you've introduced to me. We're not going to get into the offset planning per se, unless you would like to chime into something specifically. I tend to deal with that, you know, with some of my strategists, uh, the one that we do with the PRP, the only one that we do is the defender where we basically get a, de a deduction after the tax is triggered to try to offset some, but we can only take a bite at the apple. We can't solve all problems. Is there, would you like to elaborate on anything that from your side that, that um, interests you? No. Or? There, there's a few years ago, there was a, an ability to use the, the immediate expensing rules to do exactly what you're saying, which was um, to mitigate a tax that, that was realized um, by investing in a property that was immediately expensable. Mm -hmm. So tax on one hand, ex uh, deduction on the other hand, and eliminate a lot of your tax. Unfortunately, it, it, that strategy doesn't work for your California or any other state, well, California for sure. Um, your state tax there. So I did that deal myself. Um, it took care of my federal tax. The immediate expensing did, but I had to pay the state. But unfortunately, I, I don't even see a lot of value there anymore because that has been phased. It's being phased out uh, pretty quickly now. I think you're down to like 70%. Are you talking about the bonus? Yeah. Yeah. Six, 60, but it, you know, there's all this hubbub about because it was, it was a hundred, two years ago, 80 last year, 60% depreciation this year. And then they're talking about retroactively going back to a hundred. Cause I'm sure they're getting, you know, a, a, a lot of people uh, complaining about that. Um, so we don't know where that's going to end I'd up. I'd love right? to see that come back. Actually. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that affects some of the friends that, uh, that we refer to again, I don't do investments, but I get into the resources. Okay. So let's, let's wrap up. Um, uh, Javier, again, you're a great resource for me, but you are the CEO for the company. So I don't want everybody listening to ring your desk phone. <laughs> okay, buddy. So, okay. And, I, and I'll tell you, you're so kind. You know, if I say, Hey, I've got a buddy or somebody or a client that I really, you know, you know, I enjoy and everything you're, you're more than accommodating, but again, you have a, a team of people. So if somebody is interested, they want to evaluate all this stuff. How would they come into Asset Preservation Inc. and then tell us what those um, access, access points are? Email yeah, yeah, very stuff. simple. We have we do have a really great team. Um, you know, again, we've been doing this for 33 years nationally, and we most of our of our staff, our associates, have been here for 15 to 30 years. So it's a fun place to be, and and what we do is fun. We all enjoy it. Um, I'll give you the 800 number. That's the easiest way to reach one of us. And if you ask for me directly, you're going to get me. It's 800-282-1031. That's a tough one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And I, I've, I've known your team quite a bit. I've fly fished with Bob and all that good stuff. So you've just got great people and, and such a great company. Um, so thank you so much, my friend. Uh, appreciate it. Um, we're probably going to have more uh, later. Uh, we're certainly going to feed off this. Um, I, I've got a, the, one of the, the property management guys that I deal with, Jeff Lawson, I'm going to have on here in a little bit, and, and he's going to uh, do it from the perspective of property management. So we're just going to keep feeding on this and getting resources to everybody. Would Excellent. you like to conclude with anything, Javi? Yeah, I want to say thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. And uh, hopefully all this info came across uh, nicely and understandable. Uh, appreciate it, Bill. Thank you. And Ray, thank you. Yep. Thanks so much. We're going to oh, yeah. see you. And I think next time you're buying lunch. Yes. Yep. Yep. I'll okay. see you in a couple of years. Okay. Take care. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> okay. For everybody else, um, we're going to wrap up here, Bill, do your thing, man. <laughs> Before I do my thing. That was an interesting conversation. And I got to tell you, Ray, every time I come into this podcast, I come in dumb. I come out a little bit smarter every time. Uh, Javi did a really nice job of uh, making this understandable. So thank you, Javi. I pre really My appreciate pleasure. that. Ray, if people are listening and are thinking, I want to get in touch with that Ray guy, how do they do that? Well, they can contact us at, of course, trust CFO, trust-cfo.com. 
Um, I don't know that I, I, I uh, just read it out the 800 line after I hearing Javier do his, um, we have an 800 line, 800-730-3020. Um, you know, and, and like, like Javier, I'm always reachable. Um, the way we have everything designed, uh, I want to, you know, resource people and get them to the right parties. It doesn't take me long to do that. You know, so you can call me on my cell phone, 916-214-3020. Same last four digits at the 800 number. Um, pr probably the best though, is reach out in the email and, and just pr put a line of what you're looking for and we can get you to the right party quickly. And if we can't help you directly, we, we know a lot of people and we'll get you to somebody that can. So with that, Bill, I think we're going to wrap up on 1031 exchanges. Yeah, very good. Mastering, Interesting episode. mastering 1031s. Mastering 1031, which are the last four digits of the contact number for Javier, by the way. <laughs> All that information is going to be in the show notes. For those of you who don't have pencils, maybe you're listening to this on a plane or you're driving, don't panic. You can just look there. The other thing you can do that's really easy is just hit the subscribe button. Uh, if you are not already a subscriber, clearly there is a benefit to subscribing to this podcast. And one of them is that you don't have to remember when or where you heard it. Because once you're a subscriber, you will automatically be notified every time Ray drops a new episode of the podcast. And if you find it interesting and you find it useful, let other people know about it. Spread the word. Word of mouth is great in terms of getting getting the word out. And we appreciate you doing so. Yeah. Until and, next and by the way, we're seeing the impressions every time a new episode goes out. It's it's yep. like compounding, es escalating in terms of the numbers. And again, I, I think this one is really going to hit home and it's going to launch us and then we can we can feed on it. So, all right, Bill, thank you so much. Have a wonderful week, gentlemen. Yep, everybody have bless. a great week. Until the next time around, I'm Bill Tucker on behalf of Ray saying thank you. And I'm reminding you that you can go out today and make it a great day or not. Don't procrastinate <laughs> either. Don't procrastinate. Either get it done or don't do it. <laughs> Until next time. Cheers. Thank you guys for listening. Cheers.